Hello and welcome. My name is Ben Judah. I'm a research fellow at the Hudson Institute and I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Sir John Sawyer's GCMG, the former chief of Britain's legendary secret intelligence service, also known as MI6. Today, Sir John is the executive chairman of Newbridge Advisory and in the course of his career in British diplomacy has been Britain's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York and Her Majesty's ambassador to Egypt. Thank you for joining us here today for a discussion on Britain in world affairs. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Let's begin not where discussions of Britain often do in looking back from 1945, but in a far more useful comparator, I think, which is London's position at the end of the Cold War. So I guess my first question for you is, do you think that Britain is more or less of an intelligence power than it was in 1990? Uh, well, it, that's not a straightforward question to answer. I think in the, um, uh, in the Cold War, uh, the, the intelligence was not playing the sort of lead role. It was a defence-based um, uh, conflict with uh, uh, passive defence on both sides, nuclear arsenals and so on, um, and uh, lots of major exercises. Intelligence supported that. I think what's happened since 1990 is that the threats we face, whether it's terrorism or cyber uh, or um, the, uh, the uh, more complex actions of, of hostile powers like Russia or Iran, um, actually intelligence has become the dominant and most important element of a Western country's uh, defences, giving you advance warning of what is happening. It's intelligence methods that are uh, are crucial to dealing with the threats of the 21st century. And in that regard, I think uh, uh, Britain is uh, a very significant intelligence power, um, in some ways more capable on the intelligence side than we were uh, 30 years ago. So brings me to my second question, which is the UK more or less of an intelligence partner to the US than in 1990? Well, um, the, the role of intelligence has changed quite significantly, as I say. Um, I, th I think the alliance that we have between the United States and the United Kingdom is very deep and very profound. Um, the Five Eyes partnership between our two countries with uh, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, um, it, it finds its greatest depth in the cooperation amongst the uh, SIGINT agencies, the National Security Agency in, uh, in uh, the US, Government Communications Headquarters here at Cheltenham in the UK, and counterparts in the other three Five Eyes capitals, um, where they basically divide the world up between them. Um, and uh, when I was chief of MI6, <clears throat> some of the uh, most serious terrorist threats against the United States was foil, were foiled by British intelligence. And that if it had not been for British intelligence, um, they would almost certainly have led to uh, mass casualties uh, in the United States itself. So to that extent, I think the UK is a really important partner to America um, uh, and to many other countries on the, uh, in the intelligence and security world. There's been this transformation in uh, intelligence and in intelligence gathering, but do you think that Britain is more or less secure than it was in 2010, looking back over the last decade? Well, 2010, that's an unusual uh, date to start. Um, but I think uh, uh, Britain is pretty uh, secure uh, at the moment. We, there's no sort of major uh, uh, existential threat facing the country as there was during the Cold War. Um, the uh, threat of terrorism is going to be with us for uh, 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 many years to come, but it's not a, 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 an enduring week by week threat on the streets of, of the UK. Um, uh, and so I think by and large, uh, the UK is quite uh, secure. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, defence in depth in the sense that our geography is quite helpful. Um, our partnership with European countries uh, on security and intelligence helps keep some of the threats that might face the UK at bay and, and at a greater distance. Um, and in some ways, the, <clears throat> the biggest threats are against uh, things like uh, uh, cyber attacks um, and also uh, things that take you by surprise, like pandemics, where intelligence doesn't have a huge role to play, except in, uh, in, in retrospect. Um, uh, but uh, so, so I think Britain is a, a pretty secure country. And in some ways, 
it's that security that led to, uh, in my view, uh, what might turn out to be a misguided decision to leave the European Union, in the sense that, well, we're fine off on our own. We can we can go our own way. We don't need that sort of depth of partnerships with, with Europe because we're not facing any serious threats at the moment. Hmm. What were the most uh, difficult challenges that emerged that uh, the intelligence services had to deal with over the last 10, 20 or 30 years? What were the toughest to to get a handle on? Well, in some ways, the uh, the toughest challenges were reorganising ourselves um, and adapting to the changing nature of the threats. Um, uh, some of it uh, is about the threats themselves. The others is about the way those threats were delivered. Uh, for example, after 9-11, um, uh, uh, when by far the biggest focus of Western governments, including the British government, was defending ourselves against terrorism, we had to get involved in a whole new uh, uh, type of operation, penetrating non-governmental organisations, you know, uh, uh, i.e. terrorist cells. Um, it wasn't hostile governments that were threatening us so much uh, as terrorist organisations. Uh, and we had to uh, uh, re-gear ourselves for that challenge. When I was chief, in some ways, the biggest single challenge was to make sure we had the technology uh, that we could uh, deploy in order to transform the way we did our espionage. Um, that uh, uh, the old the old style way of uh, sending a, uh, an intelligence officer over uh, overseas with a false passport and a false name um, and a false identity that just became uh, completely um, uh, uh, unsustainable in, in uh, an era of biometrics. And in many ways, the um, most successful development in intelligence was the use of data analytics, which of course is now standard um, in the world in which we live. But uh, 10, or, 10 or 12 years ago, when I uh, rejoined uh, MI6 as the chief, this was the new technology and it became transformative as to how we and our counterparts in places like the CIA or um, uh, the French intelligence service transformed the way in which we did our, our operations. And, and getting that technology right, uh, uh, having a shift uh, of the culture so that instead of the most important person in the intelligence operation being the agent in the field, the operator in the field, actually in some ways the most important operator that most important member of the team became the technical analyst who was looking at the data and managing the data and telling the agents in the field where the opportunities lay. Fascinating. So moving out from Cheltenham or GCHQ uh, is the wider world. From your perspective, looking back at British foreign policy in the Middle East uh, over the last few decades, were mistakes made? Well, when you look with the benefit of hindsight, there are always mistakes made. Um, uh, uh, and uh, probably the biggest single one um, which stands out, of course, is the is, is Iraq um, in 2003. Uh, under the leadership of George H.W. Bush in 19, uh, 1991, uh, there was a, uh, a, a very deliberate limit to the um, uh, conflict against Iraq uh, after they invaded Kuwait. Uh, in 2003, um, I think there was an element of hubris, uh, both in America and in, and in Britain, um, about uh, uh, what would happen after Saddam Hussein was, uh, was ousted. Um, uh, and I think uh, when we look back, uh, it's when major powers overreach that they lose their confidence, they lose that authority that they have in the world. And there's no doubt that both Britain and America overreached in Iraq in 2003. Uh, it meant that our own people um, became less interested and rather alienated from being engaged with the world and, uh, uh, and, and trying to uh, uh, um, uh, improve the quality of governments and leadership around the world. Um, and I think it also gave strategic opportunities for countries like Iran. Um, uh, which, which that wasn't obvious in 2003, but the Iranians were very skillful in the years afterwards in turning the overthrow of Saddam, who of course was the, uh, Iran's biggest enemy in, in, in the region, uh, into a great strategic opportunity for Iran. So that undoubtedly was a mistake. Doesn't mean that everything that the uh, West did in the Middle East was a mistake, far from it, but I think that was, you ask about mistakes and I think we have to identify that as one. So moving on to Syria and the Syrian civil war, where are the hinge points where things could have gone differently? I, I, 
people identify the use of chemical weapons by Saddam in the uh, summer of 2013 as a hinge point. Actually, I go back 12 months. I go back to the middle of 2012 uh, when the the, uh, uh, the civil strife and the and the civil conflict had been raging for about 12 months. Um, and uh, we had a strategic decision to take um, in the West as to uh, uh, whether we were serious about intervening and supporting the opposition to overthrow uh, 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 the Assad regime or whether we weren't prepared to do that. Um, uh, uh, and both in Washington and in London and in various other capitals, the political leadership pulled back from uh, uh, the sort of um, uh, uh, all-in approach that we adopted in Iraq or even the, the uh, 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 less interventionist but still effective um, uh, means of dislodging a regime that we used in Libya. Um, uh, uh, but then it adopted a rather sort of halfway house of supporting the opposition um, sufficiently to keep the conflict going, but insufficiently to overthrow the regime. And in a sense, we got the worst of both worlds. And then when um, uh, uh, David Cameron unwisely took the decision to intervene in Syria after the chemical weapons attacks around Damascus, took that to the House of Commons and was defeated, uh, Barack Obama then backed down, um, that then was really the, the end of any prospect of Western policy prevailing in Syria, and it created an opening for uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russians to step in and become the the uh, the main uh, shaper of that conflict and indeed of the outcome. And we can see that outcome today. So there were turning points there, uh, both in the summer of 2012 and again in the uh, uh, late summer of 2013. Um, and uh, uh, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, it's it's difficult to get these things right. But we've ended up in a position where Syria is in a dreadful situation because of the length of the conflict. Um, Assad is still in power and uh, millions of Syrians have been forced from their homes and uh, uh, well over a million have been killed. Uh, and that's a pretty bad outcome. Hmm. You mentioned uh, Vladimir Putin. So moving northwards, when did you see or feel the renaissance in the threat and capacities posed by Russian intelligence beginning after the Cold War? Well, <clears throat> uh, when Putin uh, came to power in the uh, end of 2000, beginning of 2001, um, he did so, uh, fortunately for him, at a time when oil prices were rising. He'd taken over Russia um, uh, uh, at the end of a really pretty devastating decade for Russia, uh, the chaos of the 1990s and the Yeltsin uh, uh, era. Um, uh, and we can look back on things we might have done differently in the 1990s, but most of the fault lay with the Russians themselves, uh, I, I think, the, the situation they got themselves into. Um, Putin invested, first of all, in rebuilding Russia's military, in particular their strategic deterrent, um, their fundamental defence. Then he rebuilt the and modernised the, um, uh, the armed forces, uh, and uh, uh, in parallel, he put great weight on the um, intelligence services as his as his fundamental source of support. So they got a lot of um, of uh, 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 a lot of resource, um, a lot of support to develop new techniques, um, and uh, uh, they became sort of a central power in the Putin uh, regime. Um, uh, I think some of the things that we identify, um, in some ways, Putin was reacting to what the West was doing and saying. Um, I do think, the, for example, the 2008 uh, NATO summit declaration paving the way for Ukraine and Georgia to join the 2007 or 2008, I can't recall, um, uh, to join NATO um, was a direct contributor to the 2008 uh, uh, Georgian war, which the Russians um, uh, provoked. Um, uh, likewise, um, in, uh, uh, as I say, in Syria, in a sense, we created the opportunity for Putin to intervene in, in, in Syria. And then in Ukraine, um, which was the most um, extensive uh, Russian military intervention of recent years, uh, in a sense, it was our disarray um, uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in, in how Ukraine should be integrated into the West, into the European Union, into NATO, uh, that led to uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Now, I think Russians 
completely misunderstood what was happening in in Kiev at that time. I think they uh, they 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 could not believe that the the ordinary people of Ukraine have risen up against the Russian supported government uh, of Yanukovych. Um, uh, they, they, they thought it must have been a CIA MI6 plot to overthrow uh, someone, uh, 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 one of Russia's closest allies and what they felt was uh, in a country that was a central part of Russia's um, uh, sphere of influence, if you like. Um, but uh, 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 Russia uh, and Putin um, intervened, um, one sense successfully, uh, uh, um, uh, absorbing Crimea into, into Russian territory, uh, creating the insurgency in the Donbass. But there's not really been any uh, way out for Putin from that. I think Putin is learning from this. What we're seeing uh, more recently is he's projecting power using sort of deniable mercenaries like the Wagner Battalion. Um, he's taking uh, uh, a very uh, uh, active use of um, uh, cyber methods to attack the um, authenticity, not the, um, the um, uh, integrity rather, to attack the integrity of elections, not just in America, but around Europe as well. Um, and we see this, uh, the rather brazen uh, operations of the GRU, the military intelligence branch in Russia, like the attempt to uh, uh, kill uh, Sergei Skripal in, in Salisbury a few years ago, uh, the attacks on the, um, uh, 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 the International Chemical Weapons Organization in The Hague. Um, uh, it, 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 it's that sort of um, uh, attempt by uh, Putin to push back the boundaries, but limiting the degree of confrontation with the West. He wants to do it in a sort of insidious way and undermine the unity and integrity of the West rather than actually confront it head on. So how would you characterize Russian intelligence capacities now? Are they stronger or weaker than the Cold War KGB? And what is the scale of Russian intelligence operations in Britain? It's been said well, that <laughs> it may be higher than during the Cold War. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, there's a limit to what I can say, and I have to you know, remind you that I'm, I, I, I'm a bit out of date in that I, I stepped down as chief of MI6 over five years ago. Um, but uh, uh, there's no doubt that the Russian intelligence services are uh, in the first division of, um, uh, of intelligence services in the world. They are a very serious uh, 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 set up. They have great resources. They have some very capable people and they should not be underestimated. Um, uh, uh, now, whether they are more capable or less capable in the, than they were in the 1980s, uh, it, you know, in a sense, that's a that's a theoretical de decision, uh, just a theoretical discussion. But um, uh, there's no doubt that they're very powerful inside Russia. They're a serious influence, probably more so on the top leadership uh, now than they were back in the 1980s. The 1980s. The Communist Party was the most serious uh, organization in Russia, um, and the KGB and the, and the Red Army were, were important parts of the delivery of Communist Party power. Uh, now, it, 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 there's no party structure, there's no real political structure, it's run through the intelligence services. Um, and as we've seen, um, there's been no let up in Russian intelligence operations in the West. You see that in the United States, you see it. Uh, here in Britain and around Europe, and you see it um, in, in, in developing countries as well. So uh, the Russian intelligence services are a means through which uh, Russia projects its power uh, internationally as well as keeping control at home. What do you make of uh, the debate around uh, so-called collusion between the Trump campaign and uh, Russian intelligence? Well, I've Russian got nothing. I've got nothing new to say on that. That's been investigated very extensively, um, and uh, uh, the, the uh, I, I think it's quite clear that Russia sought to intervene in those elections in 2016. This isn't new. Russia has a long history of intervening in Western politics. Um, the uh, in in my own country, there were uh, the the Soviet Union supported. Uh, uh, infiltration of the trade union movement uh, and uh, had its own sort of um, spokespeople on the ground. Uh, in France and Italy, the communist parties of those countries were backed and, and in a sense orchestrated by Moscow. In Germany, the peace movement of the 1980s had a lot of um, Soviet influence behind them. Um, so this attempt by the Russians uh, to intervene and undermine 
Western politics is deep in their culture. And I think what you saw in 2016 was uh, America facing what Europeans have faced uh, over many years. Now, were they trying to get one candidate elected over another? I, I, I'm not sure they, they were. I think what they were doing was trying to delegitimize the uh, election and make the American people less trusting of the election process and of their own uh, and of their own institutions. And to some extent, they've been successful in that. So moving further east, how much of an intelligence threat was China under your tenure? Well, China is um, uh, has been a sort of growing um, a challenge over the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, I think um, <clears throat> Under the guidance of uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, from the sort of end of the 70s, really, uh, uh, China was pursuing an approach which he characterized as sort of hide and bide, hide your capabilities, bide your time, never show leadership. Um, we're a developing country. Uh, we, we, we ease ourselves into the world um, uh, and, and establish our own strengths. I think with hindsight, 2012 was a turning point. With the election or selection of um, of uh, uh, Xi Jinping as the new leader of China, and I don't think we fully understood it at the time, but he has transformed the way the direction of China uh, from the uh, uh, the Deng Xiaoping approach, which was pursued by his two successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, and I think under under Xi Jinping we're now dealing with a different type of China, but also a much more powerful China. Uh, and on some measures, the Chinese economy is already bigger than the American economy and the European economy. Um, uh, uh, certainly, they don't have the same um, uh, defense capabilities, but their capacity to disrupt our defense capabilities is growing. Um, and they certainly have a much more active um, intelligence effort, not just aimed at um, uh, uh, ethnic Chinese people uh, in Western countries, but actually a more uh, a, a assertive and uh, effective challenge. So we do need to take uh, China very seriously. I think it's a mistake to equate the challenge from China with the threat we face from the Soviet Union, but we do also need to recognize that um, uh, this is now not just a China which um, is uh, uh, trying to become part of the existing international system tweaked to suit Chinese needs. They're looking at a more fundamental means of defending their own interests, advancing their own interests, which is not compatible with some aspects of the international system. Do you share the assessment that China is a threat to Britain? Well, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a real challenge for Britain. Um, I think what we've learned over the last few years is two things about China. Uh, one is that we do not want to be dependent upon China any more than we uh, uh, have to be or, or we are already. Uh, we want to reverse that if we possibly can. But secondly, um, uh, China is not uh, a power that is cut off from the world. We need China to help address global challenges, whether it's the challenge of uh, the pandemic we're in the midst of at the moment, uh, whether it's the challenge of climate change, uh, where uh, China, the United States and India are going to be the three biggest uh, uh, problem countries in some ways, in terms of the scale of, uh, of uh, uh, the contribution each is making to uh, the changes in our climate. And we're going to need um, China's cooperation in places like Africa. If we're going to provide debt relief uh, to Africa, it's no point just Western governments or Western companies providing that debt relief. China has to as well. And as we've seen from its performance on the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the concept of debt relief isn't part of the Chinese uh, thinking at these stages. Someone owes them money and they can't pay it, or well, they just grab the assets, uh, which, is, uh, which is a very negative approach uh, uh, and, and damaging to, to development. So uh, we, uh, there are a series of issues where we have to be able to work with China. At the same time, uh, uh, they are a power which is very, very different from Western powers, they're moving, as I say, in a more, um, uh, 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 um, uh, in, in a direction where uh, they are asserting themselves both at home and abroad in a way which is incompatible with Western interests. What we see um, in Xinjiang, 
and what we're seeing in Hong Kong, uh, the threats they're making, threatening noises they're making about Taiwan, their um, creation of uh, military bases in the South China Sea, all these are actions that we need to be very uh, concerned about and find a way to, to push back against China on. What is the significance of what is happening in Hong Kong? And do you think Britain is taking major risks here? Well, I think what's happening in China, in, in the Hong Kong is very significant. Um, we uh, negotiated again with Deng Xiaoping back in the 1980s uh, a, a concept for the future of Hong Kong of one country, two systems. Um, and that was uh, uh, the basis on which Hong Kong was returned to China in 1997 when frankly we had no alternative option um, uh, we couldn't just hang on to it after the lease on the new territories came to an end um, uh, and it worked pretty well for 20 years um, but uh, uh, the style of Xi Jinping uh, rule is not to allow for criticism not to allow for um, uh, 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 you know, popular expressions of uh, of uh, political views um, uh, and not to certainly not to allow the people to elect their own leaders um, so uh, and that's really been the fundamental issue in in Hong Kong is, is who chooses Hong Kong's leaders um, I think what we're now seeing with this new national security law is a very serious challenge the biggest so far to the process to the structure of one country two systems when when you talk to the Chinese about this they say are oh, you in the West you always talk about the two systems, you always forget about the one country and that Hong Kong is part of China. They've got a half a point there, but um, they, uh, but at the same time, they are ignoring their commitments they made in the um, uh, in the basic law and in the, uh, uh, the treaty with which Hong Kong was returned to Chinese sovereignty, where they would allow the people of Hong Kong to uh, uh, autonomous rule over the society for 50 years. We're not even halfway through that, and it's being uh, being corroded uh, very severely. Now, what should Britain do? I think, frankly, Britain has been uh, distracted this last few years. Uh, we've not um, taken seriously enough some of the challenges around the world. Uh, uh, we're distracted by Brexit and our own domestic divisions. Um, uh, I think we do need to take a more serious uh, stance here. I was glad to see uh, uh, the Boris Johnson government uh, signing up to a joint statement with Australia, Canada, and the United States, um, uh, supporting the uh, uh, position of the uh, of Hong Kong under one country two systems and I think we should be increasingly active um, uh, on that front. So moving on to pandemics, were pandemics a topic that MI6 worked on in the past or under your tenure and how does the pandemic make us rethink the role of an intelligence service? I'm thinking of how the Mossad in Israel has been sourcing PPE and other such uh, instances. Well, um, of course, if, in a national crisis, the intelligence agencies are uh, uh, are always turned to for some of the most most difficult tasks, and I don't think this um, crisis has been is, is any different. But you ask me, what were we doing on pandemics um, when I was chief uh, from 2009 2014? The answer was we weren't doing anything on pandemics. Um, uh, uh, we were consumed with the terrorist threat. We were consumed with the threats from hostile powers uh, like Russia and uh, 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 and Iran. We had the rising challenge from China, and we had a whole series of other things that we were uh, very um, uh, engaged in. Um, pandemics were part of the um, national security um, uh, threat picture that was drawn up by the Cameron government, I think in 2000, uh, uh, I can't remember, 2010 or 2011. It was up there as one of the most serious threats, but it wasn't one on which the intelligence agencies were tasked. This was a, this was a challenge for domestic uh, health services and, um, and the sort of critical infrastructure of the UK uh, to deal with. And actually, we developed quite a good plan in 2011 for dealing with pandemics. The sadness is that it wasn't properly implemented or seen through over the following uh, eight or nine years. Hmm. You're staying uh, on, uh, on Britain. Has intelligence or security cooperation been affected by Brexit? And are there any risks, especially when it comes to data sharing or other such issues, of a no deal or a bad deal Brexit? Well, I... Uh, the short answer is that so far uh, the Brexit issue 
um, has not impacted on intelligence cooperation and intelligence sharing. Um, uh, uh, the European Union is not a means for sharing or assessing intelligence. It's, uh, uh, it's all done between the agencies of the UK and our counterparts in France or Germany or Italy or Spain or Poland or wherever. Um, it's not done through EU structures. Um, and as the UK is a, probably a net contributor of defence and intelligence to the uh, 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 continent of Europe, those countries have been very keen to maintain that uh, that cooperation, as have we, because the continent of Europe is is our sort of defence in depth, if you like. Um, the, there are two things that I worry about. Uh, you mentioned data, that is one of them. The rules for data sharing in Europe are really set by the European Union. And when we were around the table, we had a voice on that. Um, and our approach was rather different, say, from the German approach. We used to we valued privacy, but we gave security at least as high uh, a priority in the debate on how you protect and use data. Uh, in Germany, uh, partly because of their history, uh, they were much more focused on privacy than they were on security. Uh, now, around the table, we managed to create rules that we were both content with, we could both live with. With Britain not around the table, the European Union will make its own uh, decisions about um, uh, about the data sharing rules uh, and it may come up with something which is less uh, to the uh, uh, less concerned and less focused on the needs of exchanging data for security purposes and I think that would be a long-term loss. My second concern is that um, uh, uh, the UK agencies and our counterparts on the continent are very keen to preserve the cooperation that we have because it's mutually beneficial. But if the Brexit negotiations end up in serious disarray uh, with a perception that the uh, EU is deliberately trying to damage the UK economy, um, uh, uh, which is possible, then I don't see how the level of defence and intelligence cooperation can continue unchanged. Um, uh, now, it's not a threat. It's just a, it's just a, a, a statement of fact. Um, uh, I think there's a reasonable chance of us coming through this. There's a lot of um, an argument going on, there's a lot of uh, uh, some posturing you might say. Uh, I think frankly the UK position isn't really uh, uh, tenable for an overall agreement and nor is the European Union position. Both sides have to come together if we're to, if we're to find a, a consensual way forward. But I do think that's entirely possible and I think it's the best outcome for Britain and for the European Union, and certainly the best outcome for continued cooperation on the issues which I've uh, devoted my life to of intelligence, security, defence and foreign policy. Staying on like Britain's capacities, has the UK invested enough in its own domestic intelligence capacities or has it let them slide somewhat at the expense of over-reliance on the Five Eyes intelligence uh, alliance? Look, we don't have over-reliance on the Five Eyes. That's a, that's a complete uh, um, uh, misreading. Um, Britain has the, uh, by far the second most powerful set of intelligence agencies within the Five Eyes Alliance, second to the United States. And as I say, we contribute a huge amount to American intelligence and American security. Uh, uh, and, and so there's no sense that we are, uh, 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 we are punching below our weight. Uh, th there was a period in the 1990s uh, when the threat from the Soviet Union had, uh, had gone away, when I think there was some underinvestment in the intelligence agencies. But 9-11 led to a reversal of that. Um, and uh, uh, as, as I was saying earlier, the threats that a modern Western country faces these days, whether it's cyber uh, or, um, uh, or uh, uh, attempts to undermine our democratic institutions, um, uh, uh, terrorism, it's intelligence agencies which are in the forefront of this, and that's been recognised uh, throughout the last um, uh, uh, 15 years by steady increases, even after the global financial crash of 2008, in the budgets of the intelligence agencies. So comparatively, we've done pretty well as a community, as an intelligence community here, and we've done at least as well as our counterparts uh, have done in the Five Eyes and in other um, uh, countries that value um, uh, intelligence cooperation. So talking about Five Eyes going forward, is there more that the UK could do to sort of formalise or expand Five Eyes into a broader diplomatic alliance? 
Or does Five Eyes, as some people might say, make us more vulnerable to uh, American pressure? But no, I don't think, um, uh, uh, I think your last point is, is not right. Uh, uh, as I say, um, I, I think in terms of disrupting direct threats on the on our uh, national territory, the UK has contributed more to the United States than the United States has contributed to the UK. Um, huh. uh, that, and I'm not bragging about that. It's just a statement of how things have unfolded over the last uh, over the last 10 years, um, uh, because a, a lot of the terrorist threats against America have been channeled through the United Kingdom. For example, the um, the uh, threat from Yemen to uh, uh, send a uh, um, uh, a cargo plane via the UK uh, into a US airspace and exploded. It was about to land in the in the United States. That was followed by British intelligence and our cooperation with uh, with Saudi Arabia. Um, likewise, the um, <clears throat> the most sophisticated bomb produced by Al Qaeda uh, was uh, disrupted by a UK operation, uh, which otherwise would have led to a a passenger plane going from the UK to the United States being blown up in, uh, in, in, uh, as it was coming to land in, in New York. And, and it's not just uh, those are ones during my tenure as chief. Um, uh, back in 2006, you had the, the, the liquid bombs uh, attack. Uh, again, planes flying from the UK to the US, which was disrupted because of the effective work of the UK Domestic Security Service, MI5. Um, so uh, I, I think we've, we in the UK have contributed enormously to the prevention and disruption of uh, terrorist threats in the United States. And we continue to contribute a huge amount in operations against hostile powers. Iran is a good example. Um, it was the UK and British intelligence that unearthed a lot of the secret activity that was going on inside uh, Iran and led much of the effort to slow that down, both at a political level and at, a, um, uh, uh, at an intelligence level. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think membership of the Five Eyes Alliance is an asset for all members of that alliance. Now, we're not solely uh, cooperating within the Five Eyes. We work closely with countries like France and Germany, Spain and Italy, uh, with the Israelis who have a very effective um, uh, intelligence effort, uh, and with uh, friends in the Arab world uh, and, uh, and in parts of Asia as well. So it's, uh, it's a wide-ranging partnership. I don't think you can expand the Five Eyes. The Five Eyes is based on a, a level of fundamental trust um, between countries that fought together in the uh, in the First and Second World Wars, uh, and it has evolved from there. You, you can't just um, uh, uh, you know conjure up that level of trust um, amongst other countries. Uh, you can negotiate treaties, you can have agreements to exchange information, but that fundamental level of trust has to be built through historical experience. But uh, I, I think um, uh, uh, the UK more than punches its weight within the Five Eyes, and we're very active in working with other countries and partners uh, in the Western world as well. So staying at home, do you share the assessment voiced by Sir Richard Dearlove that a government led by Jeremy Corbyn would have been a threat to national security? Well, Richard Dearlove will say what he wants to say. Um, the uh, uh, I think Jeremy Corbyn was a a leader of the populist left uh, with very poor credentials to be prime minister uh, and very little understanding, uh, proper understanding of the sort of strategic and, uh, and uh, uh, security threats the United Kingdom faced. Um, frankly, um, uh, the outcome of the last election in the UK um, six months ago was largely determined because Jeremy Corbyn was not a suitable figure to become Prime Minister of the UK, and that's for a whole host of reasons. Um, uh, had he been elected, uh, then obviously um, uh, the system would have tried to make it work. Um, uh, uh, we see in other countries uh, 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 leaders who are not that well uh, geared to or suited to being, uh, being leader, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the system, the structure, the institutions will come in behind them and make it work. Um, uh, uh, and I'm glad to say that Jeremy Corbyn wasn't elected. So looking forward now into the future, you know, I'm very interested in what it would take to make global Britain more than a slogan. You know, so what do you think the UK has to do to restore its uh, reputation? What does Britain have to do to make its foreign policy 
more effective? Are there new institutions that need to be built around five, five eyes or maybe around the E3 in partnership with France and Germany? Well, uh, I would take a step back from that. Um, I think the times in my professional lifetime when we have been most uh, effective, most influential, most powerful in the world, uh, when two things have fallen in place, when we've had respected and really effective leadership at home, and when our UK economy has been performing uh, uh, in a very strong manner. We had it in the 1980s when um, Margaret Thatcher uh, was prime minister. Uh, uh, we had it again uh, from the late 90s through till 2010 when um, uh, Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown were, were prime minister. And I think in those, uh, in those sort of 20 year periods, um, uh, uh, Britain was uh, a really effective player in the world um, and in, in a way in which we're not at the moment. Um, I, I think for Britain to become uh, once again respected and influential and powerful, uh, we need to have demonstrably capable leadership. And this is not a, 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 a criticism directed at, uh, at Boris Johnson, but he has to step up to being an effective leader and have powerful people in the top levels of government, which he doesn't have at the moment. And we've got to get the UK economy going. Uh, just, and, and, and that will be a real tall order after the recession caused by COVID and after the turbulence caused by us leaving the European Union. Uh, so uh, I, I think restoring Britain's strength abroad and in the world, that work begins here at home on the economy and on leadership. Is there more that needs to be done towards rebuilding the foreign office, rebuilding our diplomatic capacity? Is there work there that needs to be started too? Yeah. Uh, look, all the institutions by which you project power in the world uh, need to be um, uh, uh, need to be running effectively. Uh, I think we can identify uh, two parts of that which have done really well. The first is our international development effort. Uh, where um, uh, 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 DFID has been one of the world's leaders, both in, in the operations and, and uh, contribution that's made and in its intellectual uh, input. And I think in the intelligence world, we've played a really leading effort as well. I think our diplomacy and our defence has not had the same level of investment. Um, and uh, I think the Foreign Office um, has suffered from not having the same uplift to its budgets, for example, um, uh, as the uh, as the development uh, budget and the intelligence budget have had. Uh, I think if you want to be really effective, you've got to support all four um, uh, branches of your international effort, uh, which is uh, defence, foreign policy, intelligence and, and, and development effort. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, there's a bit of a gap there because the Foreign Office should be playing a leading role, but a bit like the State Department in the United States, it's sort of suffered, it's been sort of squeezed out uh, by a combination of a powerful center of government uh, working with the, the power agencies of, um, in the US's case of the Pentagon and uh, Langley and, and, and so on. Um, and in the UK's case, uh, uh, a lot of the soft power has been delivered through the development budget rather than through diplomacy. So uh, there's more to be done there, I agree. What do you see as the future of the transatlantic alliance? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think the, um, the, the, this alliance is not an alliance of politicians or a transactional alliance. It's a fundamental identity of culture, of values, of legal systems, um, a belief in the rule of law, a belief in independent institutions. Democracy is not about elections. It's about a whole fabric of, um, of, of values. Uh, which are underpinned by our institutions and by, by our legal system. And I think that will remain in place. It's going through a turbulent period at the moment, um, both in Europe and in America. We're going through a nationalist phase. Um, and I think that is partly um, a consequence of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, uh, economic disruption since 2008, the inequalities in our society, in some ways, the failures of some of the foreign policy ventures of the last 20 years, like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think we're going through a difficult phase at the moment. Um, uh, I, I think in some ways, this pandemic, awful as it is, is um, uh, making ordinary people look at governments and realise, actually, they're rather important for my safety. Uh, rather important for my quality of life. We need to get this right. We need experts to be respected. 
Um, there was a, a time during the Brexit campaign here where one of the leading Brexiteers said, uh, to dismissed experts. Experts, people don't have any time for experts. And the sad truth was, he was probably right at that time, but they certainly have time for experts now. They're desperate and craving for experts uh, to help them through this uh, this COVID crisis. Um, and I think we, we might see one of the silver linings from this big black cloud of COVID uh, being a return of respect an expectation of respect for uh, governments and for public servants and an expectation of real serious competence at the heart of government rather than uh, political posturing. Now I just want to ask two final questions to wrap up. What recent move in British foreign policy have you been the most proud of and what is the threat on the horizon you're the most concerned about? Well, I think um, of, when you look at the last 20 years, I think what we achieved on Iran um, was very significant. I think in the wake of um, uh, the rising intelligence picture of Iran um, working to build nuclear weapons um, uh, uh, back in uh, uh, the early sort of 2002, 2003 period, um, we instituted a process um, led by Britain, France and Germany, um, uh, uh, working with Iran. We made some progress at that time. It was set back when there was political changes in Iran in 2005. Um, uh, and we brought in the United States, Russia and China. Uh, and we orchestrated pressure through the United Nations when I was ambassador of the UN to, uh, to, uh, to, to build up the pressure on, on Iran. Much of that was led by the UK, the intellectual effort, the, the shape of those sanctions was largely shaped by the UK. And um, uh, we were glad when um, uh, John Kerry and Bill Burns and others were engaged uh, in the negotiations with Iran. And I think that 2015 agreement with Iran uh, was um, uh, an important step forward, which we contributed to a great deal. Now, I actually think the decisions by um, uh, uh, the, the uh, President Trump's administration on Iran have not been well thought through. Uh, in some ways, we now have a weaker Iran, but one which is even less capable of um, becoming part of the international community. And the defences we had against Iran developing nuclear weapons have been uh, have been set to one side. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, uh, we're in a worse position on Iran now than we were uh, five years ago. But uh, we'll, we'll see how that uh, dossier evolves. I think in terms of the future, um, uh, I, I, th I think the biggest challenge is how we um, uh, manage the relationship with China. Uh, uh, the uh, I, I think the United States approach uh, has been right on identifying the scale of the problem we face. It's been wrong in some of the confrontational approaches that it's, uh, it's adopted. Um, but certainly the views in Britain and in Europe <coughs> uh, have been um, hardened over the last uh, 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 six months or so, the last couple of years. Uh, the European Union recognises China as a strategic rival, systemic rival. Um, uh, and, and I think the, uh, uh, the performance of China over the, over the COVID has uh, led to um, people recognizing that, you know, it's quite a problem here uh, 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 with China. So that is the biggest single um, challenge we face. I think ultimately it'll be for the United States to shape that relationship with China. They're going to be the two most powerful countries of the 21st century. And we've got to live in a world where we can coexist and actually cooperate with one another uh, rather than be in endless confrontation with each other. Now, it takes two to tango. Uh, I think there's a problem in Beijing. Uh, I think there may also be uh, 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 an attitude in Washington, uh, which is uh, relishing this confrontation. Um, uh, uh, but I think with the, the outcome of this, over the next decade, it's not just going to be the next year or, or, the, uh, or, or so, it'll be a decade long effort to put in place a cooperative framework where we're not reliant upon China, but we can deal with China and China doesn't feel threatened in, uh, by us. So it, 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 it resorts to uh, aggression itself. Um, we have to find a way of coexisting, which is not comfortable but it's inevitable uh, given the facts of the uh, relative power of, the, of both America and China. So John Sawyers at GCMG, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben.